double blind placebo controlled study um, testing SAR443820, which is a RIPK1 inhibitor in people with ALS. So just a few words about the role of RIPK1 in ALS. Starting from postmortem tissue from ALS patients, this pathway is activated, um, shown here in Western blot, increasing RIPK1 and also increased phosphorylated RIPK1 as well. And, and, and also in the animal model um, of, of ALS in the SOD1 mouse, if you modulate this, this pathway pharmacologically with NIC1, which is a, a specific and potent RIPK1 inhibitor, you will see that this, um, this will result in delay of symptom onset of this mouse. We've done this um, internally um, and also was published in Science in 2016. Um, also, inhibiting RIPK, inhibiting RIPK1 with NEC1 um, or with other RIPK1 inhibitors um, improve uh, motor speed and wire hanging, so uh, motor function in, in, in the SAT1 mouse model. Um, there's also a, a, a strong connection between the RIPK1 pathway and a number of causative genes for ALS. And you can see it here on, on the right side, NEC1, TBKI, optinurin, and others. Um, and this is, has been outlined in, in several publications uh, showing the strong connection of, of, um, of RIPK1 pathway and how these genes uh, work through the RIPK1 pathway. So on the cellular level, um, RIPK1 actually is expressed in, 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 in all cells, um, in, in motor neurons, in, in, in uh, oligodendrocytes, in astrocytes, and in microglia. Um, in motor neurons, um, RIPK1 pathway is really responsible for inflammatory cell death, and it's also called necrotosis. Um, so you could see here how the downstream from the RIPK1, phosphorylated RIPK1, you could see how the inflammatory cell death um, result in, in, the, in, the, in the motor neuron and how the optineurin and, and TBKI, again, these are two causative mutations of, of ALS can inhibit this, this pathway. With loss of inhibition, you, you have the inflammatory cell death, and then you have these damps, which are the remnants of, of the motor neurons. And what that causes is basically activation of the um, astrocytes and microglia. And in microglia, um, these cells become activated, and then they secrete um, cytokines and, and pro-inflammatory cytokines, which in turn also activate the RIPK1 pathway in, in the neurons. So you can see how this works as a, um, as a vicious cycle where, you know, uh, more cells dying activates more microglia and more microglia becoming activated, causing more cells dying. And, and the hope here is that RIPK1 inhibition can break this vicious cycle and work on both inflammatory cell death and microglial activation. So, um, this is how we believe the um, SAR443820, um, which is a RIPK1 inhibitor. Um, it's a CNS penetrant RIPK1 inhibitor. Um, just want to just highlight here that this is an investigational compound and has not been approved uh, by any regulatory agency. It's still in development. So we have completed first in the human study um, of, of this compound, um, both single ascending dose, multiple ascending dose dosages. Um, and the, the, so far, um, the compound looks pretty safe, um, has good uh, PK qualities. Um, we were able to inhibit RIPK1 in the periphery in, 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 um, um, in, in a very kind of a promising way. And um, it's a very CNS penetrant compound, almost one-to-one -one, um, ratio in the plasma, uh, unbound plasma to, to the CSF. So it's, we think this is a, a very good compound to kind of move forward. It's, a, it's, a, it's an oral um, uh, small molecule. So just a few words on the Himalaya trial. It's a phase two trial um, of SAR-443820 in ALS patients. The, the overall goal is to de determine the safety and efficacy. Of, of this compound in people with ALS. You can see the design at, at, at the bottom. Um, after a 28 day or four weeks of screening, patients are randomized to either the uh, RIPK1 inhibitor or placebo uh, in a two to one randomization ratio. 
Um, that's for 24 weeks or six months. And then after that, all patients who finish the study um, will be eligible to join the long-term um, extension study for up to a year and a half um, afterwards. So it's an open label extension period after the double blind period. The primary endpoint is the change from baseline in the ALS functional rating scale um, at 24 weeks. And the secondary end, uh, endpoints um, include CAPS, respiratory, HHD, and, and, and plasma neurofilament, in addition to safety, tolerability, and, and, and PK. I would say the inclusion and exclusion criteria are um, very standard for ALS trials. So pretty inclusive in terms of age between 18 to 80, diagnosis of ALS based on the SQL criteria, less than two years of disease duration and more than 60% of uh, slow vital capacity at, uh, at screening. Um, patient needs to be able to swallow the tablets at screening um, and they could be on, on Rilizol or Idarovone on a stable dose. Um, they just cannot start um, Rilizol or Idarovone during the study. The exclusion criteria, um, there's some interactions with uh, certain medications, so we'll exclude these, these medications, CYP3, um, A4 inhibitors. Actually, none of the common um, medications taken by ALS patients are, are belong to this group. Um, history of seizures, um, any cognitive impairment, and um, obviously patients participating in other investigational studies and other trials will not be allowed to participate in this study. Um, it's a global study, um, 60 um, sites. Um, globally, you can see um, in green here, it's North America, so United States and, um, um, and Canada, um, several European sites, uh, China and Japan. Um, and um, we are planning to have the first patient um, enrolled in the study in, in the first quarter of, of next year, of 2022. Um, and, and I would like to thank the steering committee. Um, I have the names listed here um, who helped us through um, the design and, and, and hopefully will help us through the conduct of, of this trial. Um, here's the contact of Lee Shonk. Um, she's the medical director running the study and my contact information as well in case uh, there's any questions. And that's my last slide, Bob. Well, thank you. That was succinct and very, very exciting uh, and much appreciated. Uh, I, I have a, just a couple of questions. Can you characterize for us or tell us a little bit about the long-term consequences of lacking, i.e. full inhibition of RIPK1? And specifically, what, is the K, what does the knockout mouse look like? So um, the knockout mice of RIPK1, if you knock out the whole RIPK1, they, these mice actually, they don't survive. They, they die. Um, um, postnatally, but if you um, if you have there's something called a um, a RIPK1 dead kinase dead um, mice, so there are certain mutations where you can knock knock out basically the kinase function of the um, of RIPK1, which is what we're trying to do here. So this RIPK1 inhibitor is is a kinase specific RIPK1 inhibitor. It doesn't inhibit the whole RIPK1 function. It inhibits only the kinase function. I see. And these mice are no, developed normally, and and they 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 live normal lifespan. Interesting. So, can you just comment on what the other functions are? I mean, presumably in the nice signaling pathway you showed us with DBK1 and optoneurin, that that is kinase dependent. But can you say a word about the non kinase functions of RIPK1? Yeah. So the non kinase function, which is not the interest of, of, and we, we're not engaging here, is mainly um, the NF-kappa-B pro-survival um, kind of pathway. And that's why these mice kind of tend to, you know, die early after um, it, the knockout mice. They have, they, they lose the whole um, RIPK1, the scaffold, the whole scaffold of, of RIPK1. And again, the, um, the kinase dead mice, which is the kind of extreme what you could get from, from inhibiting the kinase. Not only they develop actually um, normally, but also they are very resistant to certain kind of autoimmune or inflammatory kind of um, diseases or, or, or models of diseases. Um, so they tend to be, you know, because of, because it, they, you know, obviously if you have a kinase dead uh, mouse, then they are very resistant to necroptosis, um, mm -hmm. which, which is a cause of, of 
you know, a lot of the inflammatory cell death. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, uh, ha have there been activating mutations identified in RIPK1 associated with pathology? Activating mutation, you mean the kinase activation? Well, I think I, I, I would make it more general than that, but in, any known variants in the sequence that activate any of its functions, just to really look at the opposite of the knockout. I mean, what I'm really struggling for is some sense of whether RIPK1 has been identified uh, and implicated genetically in ALS and in what way. So, um, so there, there, there are a few actually very nice papers and, and one of them is the ITO paper in science in 2016. Um, and what they show very nicely that they have an optineurin uh, mouse model where it's an optineurin knockout mouse model. Yep. And that mouse model represents a lot of the features of motor neuron. And then if you um, inhibit the RIPK1 pathway, whether upstream, the kinase piece, whether it's upstream or downstream, so RIPK1 dead um, or RIPK3 mm -hmm. knockout, double knockout, which is downstream from RIPK1, or pharmacologically with NEC1, in all of these, you rescue this mouse. And then on the cellular level, actually, you could do the same thing with microglia. And you could also, if you just isolate microglia, you could also from like a basically an, an, an optineurin double knockout, basically. Um, and you knock in, you know, you can, you can also rescue um, this, this model. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions from chat. Um, it, it, the first is from Dylan Neal, is RIPK1 driving necroptosis in oligodendroglia and neurons concurrently, or do cellular, uh, different cellular populations uh, un undergo necroptosis uh, essentially serially or in different stages of disease progression? So I don't know the answer for this question, um, but but what I know is that RIPK1 is expressed in all of these cell types and, and, and it's implicated in, let's say in MS. So we, we've done a lot of, so this, this, pro, this, same, this same compound is now being developed for multiple sclerosis as well. And we have a phase two trial in MS starting also next year. Mm -hmm. And we've done actually a lot of experiments in, 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 in different, in different uh, MS models. Um, and and it, has, it has a very good effect on um, on oligodendrocytes, you know, you know, if, if that's the question. Uh, next question from Chad is: At the drug dose level you are using, how fully inhibited is RIPK1? Presumably, the kinase is not 100% inhibited. Yeah. So, um, so they you have um, a number of things. So, I would say we're inhibiting um, very strongly. So, more than 90%, um, even at trough. Um, so it, with, with the current dosing schedule and, but, but obviously there are other, you know, there are other things to kind of keep in mind. There's an assay, obviously, you know, floor of the assay. Um, mm -hmm. So I haven't seen this assay, for example, going all the way to hundred percent even, you know, so there's a floor effect of the assay. And remember that we're measuring this in PBMCs in the periphery, although RIPK1, mm -hmm. although the, the, the compound has, you know, one-to-one -one bioavailability in the plasmids and, and CSF, you know, I don't know the, the exact number in humans um, in, in the CNS, but we're, we're exp that was our goal is to have actually very strong inhibition in, in the periphery at trough to ensure that we're hitting the target as hard as we can. Excellent, excellent. And then one final question is, is this, uh, can we track common DAMPs? And you alluded to those as downstream um, parts of the pathway in patient CSF as a marker for target engagement? Not as far as I know. Okay. All righty. Um, then I think that's great. <clears throat> I think we'll move on for now. 